If you're a first time guest with us this morning, we have been part of the series. We've been going through a series in the life of Jesus from Christmas to Easter. And so last year around this time, Mindy said, you know, pastors always preach on Jesus's birth at Christmas and Jesus's death and resurrection at Easter, but nobody preaches on his life in between. So I took that idea and I pretended it was my idea. And then I started this series and I, we've been going through what happened between the manger and the empty tomb. What, what was his life like? And so we've looked in the Gospel of John all the way through the book about who Jesus said he was. What did Jesus teach? What miracles did he perform? What people did he impact? And as we go deeper into this story, you start to feel the pulse of the story start to quicken. The stuff that happens around Jesus starts to get more important, more serious. The crowds that start to follow Jesus get larger and larger. All of a sudden, he's making waves in this country that he finds himself in in first century Israel. So he's, he gathers these people around him, and the people are the poor people, the common people, the forgotten people, the downtrodden people, and they become like this grassroots army that surrounds Jesus. And they start to follow him, and they start to think, maybe Jesus is the answer to all our political problems. Have you heard that lately in the, in the news? Maybe Jesus is the answer to our political problems. But these people looked at Jesus and they didn't want a Messiah. They wanted somebody who could come and conquer, who could free them from the oppression of Rome. And so, so the, the story starts to get more dangerous. There starts to be talk and stirring of political rebellion and all these things. And then all of a sudden, when the story is getting at the biggest point, Jesus is arrested, betrayed, put on trial, and executed. It's like this twist in the story. If you're reading this for the first time, you think, well, this isn't how the story is supposed to go. It was building up to a climax that, and now it's just kind of falling away. And his followers are reeling. They're thinking, what, what do we do at this point? Jesus' disciples go into hiding. On a Saturday before his resurrection, they're, they're, they're behind locked doors and they're weeping and they're mourning and they're praying. And they're thinking, this isn't how it was supposed to turn out. Do you ever feel like your life gets to that point? Well, this isn't how it was supposed to be. How did it get to this point? How, how, how are all these things happening? Why didn't I see this coming? What's going on? Where is Jesus in the midst of it? And now we're going to meet a character who has followed Jesus for a long time. Her name is Mary Magdalene. And she's been a follower of Jesus since the beginning. And we discover her here at the beginning of John chapter 20. And she goes to the tomb of Jesus. All she wants to do is see his body. She thinks all my, my hopes and my dreams and my future is, is dashed to pieces and all I want to do is see him again. And of course we know the story. She goes to the tomb and she goes to see the body and the, the stone has been rolled away. And she looks inside and what's in the tomb? Nothing. It's empty, right? There's an empty tomb and she starts to panic. See, she had watched as the Jewish officials and the Jewish leaders and the Roman authorities had humiliated Jesus and had tortured Jesus and executed Jesus. And now she thinks they've taken his body to further humiliate him. So we find this, this, this woman who has followed Jesus and she's panicked and she's distraught and she's disoriented and she's weeping by the tomb. And that's where we're going to enter into this story. So why don't you go with me to John chapter 20 if you have your Bibles. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, there are some right in front of you, in the pew ahead of you. And we will have the words on the screen as well so we can follow along. Once you have it, if you would stand, we're going to give honor to God's Word this morning here in John chapter 20, and we're going to start reading in verse 11. Verse 11. Everybody round about there? It says this, But Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them. And I don't know where they've put him. And having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, Why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will take him away. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. And turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father, to your Father, to my God, to your God. 
And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. Why don't we spend some time in prayer this morning. Father, Easter is such a miracle to us. It was such a surprise. It's such a twist in the story. We thought you were dead, but you came back to life. We thought that, that the devil had defeated you, but you, you were victorious over him. We don't understand the story, but Lord, but you had planned it from the beginning, from before the world was made. This, this, this moment in time was the start of your church. It was, the, it was the, the defining moment in the history of our world. And I pray, Lord, that as we meet together to celebrate our risen Savior, Lord, I pray that you would remind us what it was like for Mary to see Jesus for the first time, to see him and to hold him, and to, 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 to be with him. Lord, I pray that if, if our hearts have grown stale from years of hearing this story, that today you break through the, the shell that we've developed and that you would, you would give us beating hearts again to love you and seek after you and pursue your heart. Today, I pray that we would see Jesus. In your name, amen. amen. May you can be seated. So you think about this story, when Mary goes to this tomb, her situation is desperate. It's, it's hopeless. What is she hoping to accomplish when she goes to that tomb just to, just to see his body, just to weep over him one more time? When her life seemed to be crashing down around her, I need you to see this, she found Jesus in that moment. And I don't know where we are this morning. We got a lot of people here and I, I don't know your stories. You know, sometimes I tell our teenagers, what, what would it be like if, if your story and, and what's going through your head could be put on a screen? Like, what if we could all watch it? I don't think anybody would want that. I don't want anybody to watch my story, and I'm sure you don't either. But here's the thing. I don't, I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're struggling with, but I know there's something. I, I know sometimes we deal with death in the family, and we can't figure out why God is doing this to us. And we say, Lord, well, where are you in my pain? Or maybe you're dealing with a diagnosis. Maybe you found out you've got cancer or, or, or you're dealing with something in your family and you think, Lord, where are you in the midst of this? Maybe you're dealing with a divorce that's still raw and painful and you're thinking, I can't, I can't figure this out. My world seems to be crashing down on me. Then this morning, look for hope in Jesus Christ. That's the reason why we're here. It's the reason why we're reading this story. It's the reason why we're here is that Jesus wasn't in the grave when she got there. What a horrible story it would have been if Mary would have gone to the tomb and they would have rolled the stone aside and she would have seen the body and wept over him and then left and that would have been the end. Where would we be? But instead she looks in and the body is gone. In fact, the angels tell her in Luke 24, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Right? So Mary was seeking something. She was seeking a, a glimmer of hope in that garden tomb that morning. And this is what God tells us in Proverbs 8, 17. I love those who love me and those who seek me will find me. But what are you seeking this morning? What are, what are we looking for? Are we looking for hope? That's not a word you hear very often on the news these days, is it? Maybe in the word hopeless, right? Situations seem hopeless. Finances seem hopeless. Uh, our, our political climate seems hopeless. What are we going to do about it? The problem is we're putting our hope in all the wrong places. Mary went to a tomb looking for a Savior who had risen. She was looking in all the wrong places, and we do the same things. When we go and we look for hope, and we put our hope and our confidence in people, and then people let us down, right? Now, don't look at anybody sitting around you, right? Don't say, mm -hmm, yeah, we know what that's like, right? We, we put our confidence and our hope in the wrong people, and they let us down. Some people put their, their confidence and their hope in money, and we think, if I just work hard enough, and I save up enough, my life will be better. And the problem is that money is always going to run out. There's never enough. Some people look for hope in alcohol, and I'm being serious here. They, they hope that the problems go away the deeper they go into that bottle. But the problem is when you reach the end of the bottle, you're emptier than when you first started. We were looking for hope in all the wrong places. We need to start looking for hope where, where hope is. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. See, the thing is, the, the devil and the world thought that they had killed Jesus. I, 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 I just can picture the devil on that Saturday after Jesus' crucifixion saying, I can't believe I won. 
I won. I beat him. He's dead. He's gone. Right? And then the, the horror on the devil's face when Jesus rose from the grave in victory and in power. That's, what, that's where we look for our hope. That's where we find our hope is in Jesus. So Mary was searching in all the wrong places. And what did it take in our story that we read for her to snap out of it? His voice. He said, Mary. Or he would have said in Hebrew, her name would have been Miriam. Can you, I just, I like to put myself in the story. I want to, I want to be there. I want to be the gardener, the real gardener who is standing there watching this. And so she's freaking out and she's crying and she's weeping and she doesn't know what to do. And I imagine her face in the tomb again. And then she hears that word, Mary. The hair stands up on the back of her neck and she gets goosebumps on her arms. And she slowly turns and she realizes who it is. It's Jesus. And he calls her name and says, Mary. John chapter 10, verse 3 says, His sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. I want you to, I want you to know this morning that Jesus is calling out your name. You may think, I am so far away from God, it's not even funny. You may think, I've done things, I, I thought maybe the church would burn down around me if I came through the door this morning. I don't know where you are. But Jesus is calling out your name. He says, come, come to me. Have a relationship with me. Come and accept me as your Savior. Come in and invite me in. When, when Jesus spoke that name to her, Mary, it changed everything. And listen, I, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I know a lot of you are, are, are first-time people. Uh, my parents are missionaries, and so I grew up in church. From the first Sunday I was alive, I think I was in church. We were told growing up that unless you were throwing up, you weren't allowed to skip church. I don't know if you guys grew up in houses like that, but I, 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 was, I played the game. I was in church every Sunday. I wore the right clothes. I said the right words. Brother, bless you. How are you doing today? Oh, grace to you. Peace to you. Peace be on you. I said all the right things. I sang the songs. I acted like I was supposed to. You would have looked at me and said, that's probably a Christian, probably a pretty good Christian. He preaches. And he does all kinds of stuff. But inside I was dead and I was hollow. I was as empty as that tomb. And I thought, I got to the point when I was a teenager, I thought, maybe God's not even real. Maybe all this is just, just a, a, a therapy for hurting people. Maybe he's not even real. And I never thought I would ever connect with him. And I went through my life determined maybe to go the other way. My dad was a preacher and I said, I'll never do that. Don't ever tell God that you won't ever do something. Because you will. He'll say, okay, I'll make you do that. But one Sunday... Uh, I was in a church service, and I, I honestly, I've got to tell you, I'll be honest with you, you guys can laugh at me if you want. I went to church for one reason, and that was girls. There was girls there at church, and I was 15 years old, and, and I really enjoyed uh, going to church. I, I was real spiritual for that reason, because I could sit by girls, and they could see how spiritual I was. I highlighted in my Bible so they could see, wow, he, man, he is, he's good. But I went there, and I sat down, I was waiting for the sermon to be over, and in the middle of it, I heard Jesus call out my name. I was so full of fear and shame and guilt. I was carrying burdens I should never have carried. I, I, I had lied to people for so many years. I was so afraid somebody would find out my secret. And it was there October 19, 2002, that the Lord called out my name. He said, give it up. Give up your shame. Give up your guilt. Give up your fear. Give up your condemnation. You don't have to carry that anymore. And I did. And I knelt down and I gave it to Jesus. And I accepted him as my savior. Now, am I telling you that my life was, was all of a sudden all better? And I never had any problems? Never had any, 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 anything go wrong in my life? It was just a bed of roses? No, absolutely not. That's not how it works. But I know this. Every single day, every single step I've taken, every mile in the journey, every trial I've faced, every time we've come up against something that, we, that seemed too much for us to handle, my savior has walked with me. He's been with me every single day. He shows me every single day. He calls my name and draws me to him. Every single day, he proves that he's not in that grave anymore. I live today because my Savior lives. And what I want for you this morning, if you don't know Jesus is your Savior, I want you to experience that same love and joy and hope we need it in this world. We need some good news in this world. Mary found the good news. You see that moment right when Mary hears his voice? We, we miss a verse in there, but we can fill in the gaps because the next verse Jesus says, don't cling to me. I can see Mary as soon as she hears, his, hears her name and sees who it is. I can see her. I'm not going to run because Mindy will yell at me with my knee. But she runs to him and she clings to him. It's like, it's like kids when they see their grandparents after a long time. Grandpa! 
ah, right? And they, and they run and they hug and I could just see her clinging to him, saying, I lost you once and I'm not going to lose you again. And she hugs him. And then Jesus says something kind of unexpected to her. Don't cling to me. And that seems kind of mean, doesn't it? Like, yeah, you just, Jesus, don't, don't tell me that. But he's saying, listen, Mary, I'm not going to stay here for very long. You've got to be used to not having my presence here, my physical presence. And he says, I've got something more important for you to do. So she, he tells her in verse 17, he says, listen, he says, go to my brothers and tell them, I'm, them that I'm ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. He says, Mary, I got a mission for you. I got something for you to do. And what does Mary do? She clings on his leg and says, nope, I'm not leaving. No, she does it. She obeys him. Right? She, she listens to his voice and she, she walks in obedience and she goes and tells the other disciples. Now, they don't, they, don't, they don't believe her, right? But here's the thing. This morning, I'm wrapping up here. I know we're going to be super early this morning, but I'm wrapping up because I wanted to hit one point for you today. Jesus is risen. He's not in that tomb. He's not in that grave. He rose in victory over your sin, over your shame, over your condemnation, over the things that we hold on ourselves. We say, nobody could ever love me because of the things that I've done. And Jesus says, I don't care about what you've done. I took that on myself on Calvary. And you say, but Jesus, you don't, you don't, you don't understand. You don't know what's been done to me. You don't know how they've hurt me. And Jesus says, I know exactly how they've hurt you. I know you. I know what you've dealt with. And I took that on the cross for you. And we say, but Jesus, it, it, it's, 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 it's too much. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand. And maybe some of you in this room this morning, maybe this is the first time you've stepped foot in church. And you're saying, oh, this is a lot of stuff. This is a lot of stuff all at once. It's simple. The truth is simple. We're sinners in need of a Savior. Jesus died to provide salvation that we couldn't provide for ourselves. Mary searched and searched and searched for an answer that she was never going to find until Jesus found her, until Jesus called out her name. So maybe you've been, you're, maybe you're sitting here today and, and you've, you've been in church before, but it's been a long time and, and you're kind of, there's just something holding you back. Well, this morning, Jesus is calling your name. Maybe there was something that happened in church when you were younger and it hurt you and maybe that drove you away from church. Well, I'm telling you, Jesus is calling out your name. And telling, telling you to come to him. I don't know what your story is. But Jesus knows your story. He knows what you've been through. He knows what you've done. And he loves you more than you'll ever know. And every day I've walked with Jesus. I've learned that deeper and deeper truth. Is that he loves me in spite of what I've done. I, I bring nothing to him. I, I don't wake up on Sunday morning saying. Look at all the good that I can give you Jesus. I say Jesus I've got empty hands. And I need you to fill them. So he, he tells Mary, go and do this. And Mary is obedient to him. And this morning as I wrap up, Jesus is calling each one of us to be obedient in some way. So maybe you're sitting here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You've never made a choice to follow him and say yes to him and choose him as your Savior. Then this morning, be obedient to Jesus and come forward and do that. When Mindy, I'm going to ask Mindy to come and play here. Just softly play on the piano. We're going to pray. Everybody's heads are going to be bowed and eyes are going to be closed. And if that's you, if you say, I've never, I've never chosen Jesus, I've never asked him to be my savior, then I'm going to ask you to be obedient and just come and, and make that decision today. I'm not getting you to sign up for anything crazy. I just want you to know my savior. He loves you and he gave his life for you. Maybe you've been saved, but you're not really living for him right now. Then I'm going to ask you to be obedient and come down and dedicate your life to him today. What better day than Easter to dedicate your life to the Lord and say, that's, 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 that's the day that, I, that I, I turn my life around, that Jesus changed my heart. Maybe you're not baptized yet. Then be obedient. Come forward and make that decision to be baptized this morning. Maybe you're living with someone and you know you need to get married. Make that decision. Be obedient. Come down here and, 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 and pray and commit that to the Lord and get that thing settled. Maybe you're dealing with, maybe you're dealing with something, an addiction or, 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 or maybe some bitterness about somebody that you haven't forgiven. Maybe, the, maybe this morning, be obedient and come down. Every single one of us are going to have to, at some point, face the Lord. We're going to stand in, before the Lord in judgment. Don't you want during this life, don't you want on Easter Sunday to say, I was obedient and I got, I got things settled with the Lord. And I gave my heart to Him and I committed my life to Him. This morning, whatever decision that Jesus is calling you to make, whatever He's calling your name to make, I'm going to ask many to play. We're all going to close our eyes, bow our heads. Make that decision. Be obedient to Jesus. He gave everything for you. Can't we just give a little bit back? Father, I love, 
I love you, Lord. I'm so grateful that when this situation and this world seems absolutely hopeless, that we can find hope in Jesus Christ because you overcame our sin, you overcame our guilt, you overcame our, our shame and our condemnation, and you gave us your righteousness if we believe in you. Lord, I pray this morning that we would be obedient to you, that we would pray and we would give our hearts to you, that if we need to get something right with you, that we would get it right, that we would commit ourselves to you, that we would commit our marriage to you, we would commit our kids to you, Whatever you're calling us to walk in obedience, Lord, I pray that we would do that this morning. In your name, I pray.